Good morning, everyone, um, or whatever time it is for you. I've seen some people turning this in at the midnight hour. Um, I certainly am not up at midnight. I can assure you of that. I've really tried to get myself on a pretty good schedule. Um, for me, sleeping in would be 7 30, 8 o'clock. Um, then I'm usually up and then I work out in the morning and then um, come to my classroom, which is where I'm at right now. So anyways, um, just hope you guys are doing well and hope you guys are enjoying this World War II lesson. We left off with the war in the Pacific and most of you know that the war in the Pacific ends with um, the atomic bombs but we'll save that for when we go um, get to the end of the war. So we're fighting in the Pacific simultaneously but now we're going to focus over back on Europe. Okay and just for timeline's sake remember in 1941 we were attacked by the Japanese, we declared war on Japan the next day and then Germany and Italy declared war on us. So America is not just going to just go straight over to Europe to go try to take down the Nazis. We're going to do it very systematically and working through a process. Okay, so we're going to start with our first term today, which is Operation Torch. And Operation Torch is America's first um, I guess, involvement over on the other side of the globe. And we're actually going to focus our attention in this area, in Northern Africa. Um, Northern Africa was once French territory. If you remember back to the 1800s when we said that the European nation colonized Africa, well, the French basically had North Africa. Okay, and so since France was North Africa and France fell to the Nazis, who do you think owns North Africa now? That's right, the Nazis. And um, Mussolini certainly had his influence down here as well. Okay, so we're going to talk about Operation Torch, which is the Allied invasion, meaning the United States and Great Britain. Um, they are going to invade North Africa and try to flush out the Nazis here. Okay. Operation Torch was November 1942, and it was intended to draw the Axis forces, which remember are Italy and Germany, away from the Eastern Front. Stalin is getting smashed right now um, in Russia, and we're going to talk about Stalingrad um, a little bit later, but um, they invaded um, North Africa. And um, you can see here up at the top, General Patton for the United States invaded here. And then two generals from the UK invaded here and here. And they wanted to relieve pressure that Stalin was under the influence of. And um, they encountered a German general, General Erwin Rommel. They called him the Desert Fox because he was sneaky and would do surprise attacks. And Erwin Rommel was considered one of Germany's greatest generals. Um, he was well respected by all of Germany. And um, the Operation Torch was a huge success. The Allied forces landed and ended up defeating the Germans in North Africa. Now, we're going to talk about your next term, which is Erwin Rommel, okay? And um, he, like I said, he was one of Hitler's top generals, but he had an interesting death, and we're going to talk about that. He actually started to doubt whether or not the Nazis were going to win as time went on. Rommel actually was um, one of the chief engineers in fortifying um, the French, the North here. So this area, once the Nazis took over France, they began to fortify this area, knowing that Great Britain probably would invade. So Erwin Rommel was like one of the chief engineers that made all these massive cement dragon's teeth fortifications, which I'll show you when we get to the Normandy invasion. Okay, 
And so Rommel was um, initially giving command of troops like around Hitler's headquarters. And he was a World War I fighter, and so he wanted to be in the action. So Hitler then put him in charge of the 7th Panzer Division, which is a tank division. So he was in charge of what's called the Africa Corps, and it's Africa spelled with a K, not a C. And so um, he did an excellent job leading the German troops in North Africa. Um, however, you know, he did fall to... Um, the Americans, but he, um, when, um, when the allies invaded France, Hitler put Rommel back in Northern France to guard against these out this allied invasion that they knew were coming. Well, Rommel again, began to lose confidence that Hitler was going to win this war. And he did not think that they were prepared for a full out invasion. If, uh, the Americans and the British came and invaded France, which they were right. He was right. And so he was approached by some friends that basically said, look, we're going to try to overthrow Hitler and then we're going to try to put you in charge of Germany. And so he was kind of like, OK, so we haven't studied D-Day yet, but that's when the American forces land in France to liberate the Europe from the Nazis. And um, that was June of 1944. When that happened, Rommel predicted that Germany was not in a good position to defeat the Americans. And so um, anyways, so Rommel was right. Germany lost essentially um, the invasion of France. And Rommel ended up being in a hospital after his car was attacked by these British bombers and he was kind of forced off the road. So he was um, kind of at home recuperating when there was a failed assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler. There were a few of those. Um, and his name came up, Erwin Rommel's name came up. So here Hitler's one of his top generals. His name came up when it came to maybe an attempted assassination attempt on Hitler's life. And um, Hitler sent um, two generals to Rommel's house when he was recovering from his car accident and basically said, look, we're going to allow you to choose between, you know, basically a trial where we're going to put you on trial for the assassination attempt of Adolf Hitler, which ultimately would have been execution regardless, or you can commit suicide. And so there's a, there's a movie I watched about this one time, but Rommel walks back in and tells his wife and his child, like what just happened. And so he ends up taking um, the cyanide capsules that the generals had given him. And then he, he dies and they tell him, look, we'll give you full military honor burial. Like no one will know the difference and you will go down in history as like this hero for Germany. And, um, that's what, that's what happened. And that was October, 1944, just a few months after the D-Day invasions. Okay. Well, so North Africa got liberated out of the hands of the Nazis and the uh, Italians. And so Italy is going to be our next focus. September 1943, you can see we're going to go from North Africa and we're going to go up the boot of Italy. Okay. And that is the plan. The U.S. troops landed in Sicily, which is this little island. It's like the football at the end of the boot in Italy. And um, Italy is fierce fighting. Um, we, it takes a year to even get up to basically here. So the Italians are fighting very fiercely and I'll show you why if you look at Italy here. Look what's right up the Northern part of Italy, Germany, Hitler, and the Italian forces were pushing back on the Americans as the Americans were pushing up this way. The Nazis were pushing back this way. They certainly did not want the allied forces to get up into, um, mainland Germany. And so we don't have time to go over all the battles fought in Italy, but some of the biggest ones are this Salerno and Anzio and Monte Cassino. If you guys are interested and you want to look more into that, um, you should read, read up about them. Some of the fiercest fighting happened um, in Italy, and, and that absolutely is true. Um, it's basically... Um, again, so many paddles that happen right here. We just don't have time to go into it. But one thing I will tell you is that when the allies invaded Italy, 
um, Mussolini, you know, um, here he had this dream of recreating the Roman Empire and he was going to be super powerful, which he had been in power for about 20 years now. Um, he is going to be deposed. They depose him from power. And so that's pretty surprising. Um, the king of Italy essentially deposed him and there was a new government that was set up and created. And um, it was actually on June 4th, 1944, the Americans make it to Rome. And that's considered like the fall of Rome. And uh, in, interestingly, it was June 4th, 1944, that they made it to Rome. But June 6th, 1944 is a much more important date in US history. And so a lot of our Italian divisions got pulled over to France to help with that major invasion. Okay, um, so when the Allies invaded Italy, as I was saying, um, King Emmanuel III removed Mussolini from power and they placed him under house arrest for all of his kind of war crimes and how he was a dictator and so forth. And this is really interesting. Uh, when he was under house arrest, these Nazi paratroopers staged a raid that rescued Mussolini from this ski resort where he was being held. And then um, Hitler puts Mussolini kind of as a new figurehead of this new Republic of Italy, which is like in Northern Italy. Um, and so, however, Germany is quickly losing its grip on Northern Italy um, because the by this time, the Americans are in pushing towards um, Germany. And so Mussolini um, basically agrees to meet with this group of people and um, he finds out that basically the Nazis have begun negotiating for an unconditional surrender to the Allies and he was absolutely not. And so he flees this meeting with his mistress, he, this woman, this, her name is Clara and I never know how to say her last name. It's P-E-T-A-C-C-I. Patachi? 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 Anyways, and he's driving off in this sports car that he bought as a gift for his girlfriend. And so they're heading north to Lake Como and try to get to Switzerland. And Mussolini is disguising himself. Um, he's wearing like German, a German helmet and an overcoat. But people recognize him, even though he tried to disguise himself, and uh, they recognized him. And anyways, they seize him, and they seize him and his girlfriend. And they were fearful that the Nazis would again try to get him out, so they held him like in a remote farmhouse for one night. And the following day, him and his girlfriend were driven, and they were basically ordered to stand in front of a wall and they were executed by machine gun fire. And so then Mussolini's body and his girlfriend's body and about 13 or 14 other people were dumped into the center of Milan into one of their city squares. And basically they string up the bodies and hang them by their feet upside down. And I'll show you a picture. Um, this one is from a distance. There's closer ones I'm not going to show you because people mutilated the bodies. Um, there's reports that one woman came up to Mussolini and shot him five times after he was already dead for basically um, assassinating her five sons. And here's a picture of them hanging by their feet in the city square of Milan. Um, his girlfriend is up there along with other people and again you can find better pictures online but i choose um not to look at those those are kind of yuck okay so let's get to um the major invasion the biggest day and um <clears throat> i'm actually going to pause this for just a moment just a moment Okay, hopefully that'll let me get rid of that for a minute. Um, so this is 
the English Channel. And this is Great Britain and this is France. And we're going to be talking about D-Day, which is June 6, 1944. And Hitler had been planning and preparing for an invasion around this coastline of France and he had it very well fortified. But there was speculation that the Allies would cross here. And why do you think they would cross here versus here? Okay, one of the reasons, of course, is the distance. Um, it's the narrowest point of the English Channel between the two countries. And um, Adolf Hitler had begun massing a large army here so that when they invaded that they would be ready. But... Um, the Allies were fooling Adolf Hitler by something called the Phantom Army. And it's really cool. The Phantom Army during World War II is when the British and the Americans essentially made a fake military location to kind of fool the um, Nazis. They put like inflatable tanks and fake radio transmissions and they basically staged these battlefield deceptions and basically it's really cool. Oh shoot, where is it at? Oh no. Oh, um, they, you can see here that these guys are lifting a tank but it's an inflatable tank and um, it's really kind of cool that they did this. And they had inflatable cannons and jeeps and trucks and airplanes that the men would inflate with like compressors so that as the German Luftwaffe is flying over, they would see this from above and they began amassing, like I told you, up at um, this port portion right here at Calais. And so that's really cool, but we did not cross there. We are going to end up crossing here. Okay. And so here's what's going to greet our soldiers okay so we are done with italian campaign sorry i'm going to go back to the list for a second and we are now on d-day okay let's see you can see that the beaches were heavily fortified so that the americans would not easily be able to get their ships up on or their tanks even up onto um the beaches and these big large metal contraptions kind of look like large oversized jacks if you you know what jacks are kids used to play with those um these are called like dragon's teeth or whatnot but they would obstruct the beaches so they cannot get their landing gear up there this is a nazi bunker that the guns that would meet our soldiers on d-day these 155 millimeter guns that were constantly being barraged at our soldiers <clears throat> um here's another bunker you can see that they had prepared for this invasion Okay, so we are going to land, and there's going to be five beaches that we are going to land on. Utah Beach, Omaha Beach. Those are the two that America invaded and landed on. Then you've got Gold Beach, Juno Beach, and Sword Beach. So you've got the Americans, you've got the British, and you've got the Canadians are going to all land on D-Day. Okay, And there's going to be about 200,000 soldiers under the command of General Eisenhower. They're going to land in this area of Normandy. This whole region is called Normandy. And basically more than a million troops are going to follow within a few weeks. It is the most massive sea land operation ever. And we are going to, it's very successful, but it comes at a great cost. Okay. And here is General Eisenhower and he's talking to his troops and he gives a very moving speech um, as he's prepping his, you know, his men for this massive invasion. And I'm going to read to you his speech. It's not long. He says this. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the AEF, which is the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. This is very serious, you guys. We're about to touch down into Nazi-controlled France. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine. 
the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped, and battle hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940 and 41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelmingly superiority in weapons and the munitions of war and placed at our great disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. And that is the D-Day speech that Eisenhower gave. And um, I'm telling you, if I could not, if I could recommend this enough, I would. But there is a series called Band of Brothers. And if you're on this quarantine and you're interested in World War II, I cannot recommend it enough. Okay, it's a series HBO put out many years ago. I have the box set, the box set of DVDs, but I think you could probably find it online somewhere. Um, it's well worth it. It may even be on some of the general streaming sites, but um, it's about an 11 hours if you were watch it straight through. But um, it's a series of like seven discs, and it's incredible. It tra- traces these guys from boot camp all the way to they, their paratroopers and they land in Normandy before the um, invasion happens and they try to clear out all these big guns. It's incredible. Okay. So again, there's Eisenhower's quote, um, D-Day, June 6, 1944, super famous date in our nation's history. All right, here is how our men came across on large transport ships and then they came on these little Higgins boats and this boat is made to where that front just kind of falls down and they're going to wade out and get onto the beaches. And guys, another movie is the first 25 minutes of Saving Private Ryan. If you have that movie, watch the first 25 minutes and it'll explain exactly what I'm explaining to you. It'll show you like you've never seen before. It's uh, very hard to watch. It's very um, gory and bloody and uh, it's, well, um, so here's another famous picture, probably one of the, the most famous pictures of the Higgins boats opening up and the men waiting ashore under under constant fire. The paratroopers were not able to knock out all the guns the night before. Okay. But they do end up securing the beaches and working their way through. And guys, in a little over a month, we reached Paris. And so it was a huge success. Look at that. All those troops and so forth landed. Over a million troops followed in in the few weeks after the initial landing. Here is the cemetery of all the people that died in the Battle of Normandy on D-Day and um, and, uh, and other times during the war. And um, this is the Normandy Cemetery. The Americans that we did not bring their bodies home, they are still there. And in 2017, I took students to Normandy it was an extremely moving experience for sure. Um, this is about eight miles down the beach of Normandy, and it was heavily fortified. It was um, these cliffs are about a hundred feet tall, um, and you can see that all those like craters on Point de Hoc were from uh, you know bombing the um, allies bombed this area trying to like get the Germans to like, you know, die or whatever, (laughs) get the Germans to die. That sounds very military. Um, but it's a, it's a really interesting story. This point to Hawk is that, um, these army Rangers had to scale those cliffs and try to take out the Germans. And, um, this is what was facing our men on the beaches of Utah and Omaha beach. So they had to get up on top of these cliffs and take out these guns. And it says to the heroic ranger commandos who under the command of Colonel James Rudder of the first American division attacked and took possession of the Point de Hoc. Another huge allied victory. And I was able to go up to Point de Hoc and walk around like there's walking paths and like my students got in these craters and we took pictures. It was an unbelievable experience. 
And here's um, some of my actual photos from my iPhone that I took. This is standing at the cemetery and looking out onto um, Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach. Looks just like an average beach, but wow, guys, it is not just your average beach. I was very moved because thousands of people died that morning. And there's me collecting some of the sand. Um, very, very moving, very solemn experience. And then I wrote D Day 6 6 1944. It was, um, we were there in June. And there's some students standing down into one of the craters. And it's Emily and I on top of Point de Hoc. Um, that's inside one of the bunkers. And again, inside one, or that was outside, and this is inside one of the bunkers. And um, that's the, the cliffs, so you can see the Point de Hoc cliffs. And this was just a weird thing. Like on the day that Matt and I were in Europe on the beaches of Normandy, my kids were in Florida on the beaches, and I just thought, you know, how a beach can mean different things to different people. It was really kind of moving. All right, um, I'm going to share one final story with you. I'm going to pause it so I can get it out really quick. <clears throat> okay, so some a really cool story. You know my obsession with Teddy Roosevelt's. Well, he had um, children, obviously, as you know, and um, he had several sons, and this is a picture of one of his sons, and this is his oldest son. Um, his name is Theodore Roosevelt Jr. And this guy, he fought in World War One and World War Two, and um, basically five months before Normandy, Roosevelt was stationed to an infantry division, and he he's an older gentleman even by this point. He requested to lead the attack on Utah Beach with like the first wave of soldiers, but his request was denied. Um, but he kept pushing it, you know, in true Roosevelt fashion. So they eventually allowed him to do it and they did not expect him to live through these initial landings at Utah Beach. And so um, Roosevelt was a general at that time and he was the only general to land with the first wave of troops on any of the Allied beaches on D-Day, okay? And so um, it's pretty awesome. And they made a movie about this. And I'm gonna read to you this story. The movie is called The Longest Day and he's a brigadier general. He was um, portrayed by a actor named Henry Fonda who was famous at the time. Um, all right, so let's start here. So just like his father, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. was no stranger to battle. He fought in World War I alongside with his brothers. And his brother Quentin, a fighter pilot, was killed in action in World War I. And if you see here, this is Theodore Roosevelt Jr.'s um, grave. We actually raced to find it on that day that we were there in Normandy. His is gold because he won the Medal of Honor. His brother, they brought his brother to him as well. So he's buried there. So both of Roosevelt's sons are buried in Normandy, France. So um, General Roosevelt was crippled from the physical wounds of World War I. And you can see he used a cane, okay? So he was 56 years old when he demanded to be a part of the invasion of Europe. His request was denied twice because of his age Finally, he put his request in writing and it was granted. His reasoning for returning to battle was that having a general land in the first waves of attacks at Normandy would boost morale for the troops. He was right. He said, they'll figure that if a general is going in, it can't be that rough. His leadership did encourage the young men of America to fight and to fight hard. Roosevelt not only limped from the wounds of the First World War, he also had a heart condition. No matter his age or lack of physical peak condition, he was determined to lead the new generation of warriors, who became known as the greatest generation, as they took on the Nazis. His son, Quentin Roosevelt II, was also on the beaches of Normandy that day. 
They were the only father-son duo known to fight on D-Day. So that's awesome. Teddy Roosevelt's son and Teddy Roosevelt's grandson. Here they are. Roosevelt and his boys were part of Operation Overlord, which is the code name for D-Day. The invasion would give Allied forces a chance to break the Nazis' hold on Western Europe, and it was expected to come at an extremely high cost. And it did. On the day the operation launched, even the Supreme Allied commander, Dwight Eisenhower, was uncertain that the invasion would succeed. He penned a note to be released in the event of failure, stating that all the blame was entirely his. Bombers did the best to pave the way. The B-17 Flying Fortresses, B-24 Liberators, filled the sky. Their task was to drop their 500-pound bombs right at the water's edge to stun or kill the Germans in their forts and trenches. Like his father before him, General Roosevelt led American forces as they stormed enemy fortifications. This assault on Utah Beach was part of the greatest invasion in history. He was the only general who landed in the first wave of troops. Most people would have called it a suicide mission, armed with only a walking stick and a pistol. He led several groups of 20-somethings up the beach and inland. He had a walking stick and a pistol when he landed on the beaches of Normandy. General Omar Bradley described Roosevelt's actions as the single greatest act of courage he witnessed in the entire war. His presence made a difference on the beach. Like his father before him, he led his men into battle rather than followed. This greatest generation might have been young in age before the invasion, but they grew up quickly that day. Thousands of American boys stepped onto French soil, beginning the liberation of Western Europe. These young patriots came from every state and territory throughout the Fruited Plains. Many had never been but a few miles from home, but went ashore and overseas to unknown foreign lands. Our American boys laid claim to the beachheads inch by bloody inch. The rangers climbed the cliffs at Point de Hoc under heavy, brutal German fire. They had to. Their courage, leadership, and commitment to freedom ultimately cracked the Nazis' grip on Western Europe. D-Day was the beginning of the liberation of Western Europe. Allied forces freed an entire continent of people from oppression and wanted nothing in return. Americans did not go to Normandy to conquer. They went and sacrificed to ensure that Hitler would no longer be a threat. Hitler didn't believe this was ever possible. He was certain that the soft children of America could never become soldiers. He was certain that the Nazi youth would always outfight the Boy Scouts. He was wrong. The Boy Scouts took them on D-Day. Our boys won freedom for the world that day, but at a tremendous cost. The sand was stained red with the blood of young American warriors and that of our allies. In all, 9,387 soldiers lie in rest in the U.S. cemetery at Normandy. Buried on the cliffs, their white crosses and their stars of David shine and glisten in the morning sunshine over the now peaceful Omaha and Utah beaches. One of the buried is the tallest warrior on the longest day, Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt. Fittingly, he is buried next to his brother, Quentin. Quentin is the only World War I veteran buried at the Normandy Cemetery. General Roosevelt, who died of a heart attack shortly after the Normandy invasion, later received the Medal of Honor for his heroics. And one of the coolest things that I saw over at Normandy was... um, Well, Winston Churchill said, we sleep safely in our beds because rough men stand ready in the night to visit violence on those who would do us harm. Today, we express our gratitude to the greatest generations of Americans who defied danger and fearlessly fought for freedom. They were the young breed, the rare breed, the American breed, who took to the treacherous beaches of Normandy under the leadership of a remarkable man who stood tall to lead his troops. And one of the coolest things I saw at Normandy, I I took a picture of, I didn't include it in your slideshow, but was one of the American generals, he said this, and it's, it's emblazoned on a big marble wall. If ever proof were needed that we fought for a cause and not for conquest, it could be found in this cemetery. Here was our only conquest. All we asked was enough soil in which to bury our gallant dead. And that's extremely moving that America went over to Europe and fought for that country and for those countries. And all we asked for was land to bury our dead. We did not come to conquer. We came to free the people from the hands of the Nazis. Super moving quote. And I hope that touched you today.
um, and we'll end our um, lesson today here and we'll pick up with um, the Eastern Front, Stalingrad, um, with our next lesson. All right, guys, take care. Good talking with you.